So we're honored to welcome our presenter for the evening, Jason Fishbach. Jason is the Food and Energy Woody Crop Specialist with UW Extension, the co-leader of the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative, and coordinator of the Hazelnut Processing Accelerator. He and his family live and farm near Ashland, Wisconsin, producing cut flowers, vegetables, currants, and hazelnuts. All right, welcome everyone. All right, so today, uh, or this evening's presentation, I'm going to cover four main things, five main things really. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of the, the world hazelnut industry and what's happening in the U.S. to give you some sense of when we're talking about a hazelnut industry, what we mean. I'll talk more specifically then about where things are at in the upper Midwest specifically and in Wisconsin, but really that's going to include uh, a lot of things that are happening uh, east of the Rockies with hazelnuts. I'll get into a lot of the specifics of hazelnut breeding and production for those of you that are considering planting hazelnuts or wondering where things are at on, on germplasm improvement. And then I'll go through the work that's being done on uh, processing and marketing because believe it or not we do have some hazelnut production happening in the upper Midwest and some of those nuts are starting to be processed and sold. Uh, just backing up here, the any information that I'm presenting will be available uh, on this recording, but also at MidwestHazelnuts.org is the website for the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative. And there's a, a whole page on resources for growers where we post our research bulletins and, and other technical information. There's also on our About Us page uh, a new blog that we're starting to uh, uh, post information on that you can uh, see what's happening and more or less real time every week or so we try to post something. All right, so let's start with hazelnuts, the global commodity. And this graph shows where hazelnuts are produced in the world. And you can see pretty clearly that Turkey dominates global production of hazelnuts, significantly dominates. And they have about 1.5 million acres in production. These are primarily small uh, land holdings, mom and pop operations. Almost all of it is, is harvested by hand. All of, almost all of it is harvested in husk, uh, which means they have a drying and, and dehusking step. Uh, you notice Italy, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Chile, USA, and Spain, they round out the top uh, roughly 10 growers in terms of scale. Uh, this chart does show um, the 2017 production and the five-year average in orange. Well, I'll skip over that slide when we get to it, I can fill in. So basically what's happening is there's significant changes occurring in global hazelnut production, primarily because there's been a decline in Turkish production with the political situation, it's a little less certain, plus just the overall demand for hazelnuts continues to increase. And so we're seeing uh, a big expansion production in the U.S. out in uh, the Willamette Valley of Oregon and a significant increase in production in the southern hemisphere, primarily uh, Chile and, and Australia. And this is driven in part by uh, Ferrero, the makers of Nutella, that want fresh nuts six months of the year instead of once a year. All right, so on the consumption side, uh, pretty much most of the hazelnuts are consumed where they're grown. Italy, Turkey, Germany, France are the largest consumers. And you notice the U.S. makes the top 10 list um, in terms of this is showing tons of kernel consumed by the country per year. So keep this in mo your mind, and then we switch to the next slide. And notice the per capita consumption and how that changes uh, across the top 10 countries, and look how little we eat per person in the U.S. So this creates both challenges if you're trying to sell hazelnuts, because the American consumer really doesn't eat much hazelnut, but it's a huge opportunity, because there's no reason why uh, U.S. consumers can't eat hazelnuts or won't eat hazelnuts. They just really haven't been introduced to it, or if they have, it's... Uh, imported hazelnuts from Turkey for the most part and the quality sometimes isn't so great because they could be two years old and hazelnuts are really not good unless they're eaten uh, fresh or soon after they're they're um, cracked. Well the big companies, our big food processing companies, certainly see this change in hazelnut demand as an opportunity and we're seeing new hazelnut products out on the marketplace. Um, including Snickers with hazelnuts. There's about four or five companies now making hazelnut-based spreads, and you may have noticed in some marketing that Hershey's is now selling a, a hazelnut kiss. Uh, and these guys, when they buy hazelnuts, they buy hazelnuts by uh, the container load, 
and their demand for these nationally or internationally branded products outstrips even anything that Oregon can produce. So this is, um, we watch these guys though for, for trends in terms of how much they're, um, what they see as opportunities for hazelnuts, but really for supplying these companies with hazelnuts, we're so far out of their league right now that it's not really an option. So let's look at the Oregon hazelnut industry. It accounts for 99% of U.S. Uh, production. There's 70,000 acres roughly uh, in total, and point out here, 40,000 of that is new since 2015. And it's pretty astounding to see what's happening in, in the Willamette Valley right now. Now, for perspective, um, the U.S. is the largest producer of almonds in the world, and in California, there's 1.3 million acres of almonds, and right now there's only 70,000 of hazelnuts. So there's some speculation that hazelnuts will become as popular uh, a, a nut as uh, almonds. Uh, people talk about they're becoming almond fatigue because almonds is the nut of choice in the U.S. and it's in everything and consumers are looking for other options. So to go from 70,000 acres to 1.3 million means there's a lot of opportunity uh, coming for hazelnut production. So most of the production in Oregon or in the U.S. is in the Willamette Valley. It's a major horticulture region in the U.S. and because of that, because it's, it's such a sought after place for producing nursery plants, bedding plants, small fruits, hops, wine grapes, all these important specialty crops, there's a lot of competition for land. And now with hazelnuts exploding, it's just continuing to put upward price, price pressure on land. We're talking fifteen to twenty thousand dollars an acre, which creates perhaps some opportunities in other parts of the country where land is a lot less expensive. This is primarily what um, mature hazelnut in Oregon looks like. This is, uh, if you talk to growers, this is sort of a legacy crop that they had on the back 40, and it was almost exclusively for exporting in-shell hazelnuts to China. Uh, it really wasn't that important of an industry in Oregon. There wasn't a lot of production uh, going into U.S. Con to consumer markets. It was all being exported. Well, along came eastern filbert blight, which is a disease that's native to the eastern U.S. It's a fungal disease that's lethal to hazelnut, uh, unless the hazelnut is tolerant or resistant to it. And the cultivars, primarily Barcelona, that were producing these inshell nuts in, in Oregon, uh, was highly susceptible, and this is what the orchards looked like. So there's decimation that happened, but really, you talk to growers now, it was painful, but this is what has totally rejuvenated or revitalized the uh, Oregon industry largely due to the Oregon State University breeding program. Uh, you might recognize some of these people, but uh, the two surrounding me, I'm in the middle, uh, the two are the, the technicians that work with Sean Mellenbacher and have been developing improved hazelnut uh, material, primarily a material that's resistant to eastern filbert blight. The seedlings we're standing in are actually um, progeny from crosses that we made here in, in the upper Midwest with some of our top selections, American hazelnut selections, with their European selections to try to develop these hybrids that, that hopefully will work not only in Oregon, but also in, um, in the eastern U.S. And we're, both projects are at slightly different reasons. OSU is interested in taking the, the resistance to eastern filbert blight, which is in our native populations, uh, and moving it into their organ selections, and we're interested in taking the larger diameter kernel and higher quality kernel uh, from the organ varieties and moving it into our American hazelnut germplasm. So it's a it's a nice collaboration that's that's been happening. Uh, this is what some of the modern or the, the newer um, uh, hazelnut production systems look like in Oregon. Uh, and the reason they have these floors with no vegetation and they're so flat is that the way they harvest is the nuts fall out of the tree. They blow them out from underneath the tree into windrows and then sweep them off the f orchard floor. And what's allowing this expansion is the recent release of EFB resistant cultivars that Oregon State University uh, developed, which is what I mean by the, the revitalization. Um, and this is, you know, you drive through the Lamont Valley these days and you see hazelnuts off into the horizon. You know, this is what 40,000 new acres looks like. And there's likely more than that because there's so much uh, planting happening. Um, you know, our field days in the Midwest for hazelnuts, we, we're lucky if we draw 50 people. Uh, the field days in Oregon, uh, they have to have parking attendants. And they're regularly over, you know, six, seven, eight hundred people attending their, these field days. There's big expansion happening in the processing side. Obviously, with all this new production coming online, they need 
somehow to handle it. This is the uh, new processing facility of the Hazelnut Growers of Oregon uh, Cooperative, and similar. This is a you know 22 million dollars in just equipment, uh, and, and not quite as large expansions, but there's expansions happening at the other processors as well. And the reason is this that we're seeing this expansion is the rise in pay price uh, because there's just not enough supply to meet the demand. And this is showing the pay price for in-shell hazelnuts by one of the processors uh, over roughly the last six or seven years. And you can see it's, um, you know, well over a dollar uh, a pound in-shell, uh, sometimes over two dollars a pound. And you can see then what happens to the uh, cash flow uh, for these um, businesses as the the um, uh, price continues to rise. So this is a, a you know your classic reverse J curve, the cumulative uh, cash flow. So just like any perennial crop, you're going to be in the red for a while until your uh, uh, plants start producing, and then you start having positive cash flow, and, and eventually you break even. And the difference between a two dollar pay price versus a dollar is is significant, especially if you project that over long term. So that's what's driving all the investment in in their their industry right now. Now there's some challenges, and those challenges in Oregon may create opportunities for us, particularly if Oregon is able to to drive the um, market development and train U.S. consumers to start eating more hazelnuts is that we may have some advantages that over their challenges. So for example, this uh, orchard floor management really is not environmentally sustainable. There's nothing living. There's huge dust clouds in the fall throughout the valley uh, with all the scraping that they have to do. And really from a production standpoint, it's a challenge because if they get early rains in the fall, that's pretty heavy clay soil. It turns to gumbo and now they've got all these hazelnuts sitting in the mud and it's a nightmare to harvest, and they'll lose significant uh, crops, percentage of their crops, if they do get early rains. They also are susceptible to wind throw. Uh, they, they grow these as single stem trunks, uh, trees, instead of shrubs like we do, and they're susceptible to lodging, particularly um, if they don't have good wind protection and they've got heavy early crop year, uh, yields. And from an efficient stamp, efficiency standpoint, these big trees look cool, and they'll actually have weddings underneath these things, but they're not very efficient at producing nuts because they're, they're mainly growing wood. And we see this across the perennial uh, woody crop um, production systems. For example, we used to grow apples like this. Now we grow apples in super high-density plantings. The reason is because they're easier to manage. They're easier, easier to manage pests. Labor is, is easier. And you actually get better production per acre because you've got more uh, efficient light capture. So let's talk hazelnuts in the upper Midwest. Um, you know, really it could be the first major nut crop for Wisconsin. I know there's some walnut production, but we, we think hazelnuts can be much, much bigger uh, than, than walnuts and certainly could create a crop of significant scale. The uh, upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative was launched in 2006. This is the a collaboration between the University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin, and early adopter growers to build their, their industry. And right out of the gate, our goal has been to develop and prove germplasm. We really don't, even today, have germplasm that's proven capable of supporting viable production. Yeah, we can produce some nuts, but in terms of making money, we haven't been able to do that yet, not without improved germplasm. And along with that is once we identify um, uh, genotypes that we think are, are suitable, we need to be able to develop or to propagate those efficiently. American hazelnut, uh, when it's in the parentage of these hybrids, does not like to be uh, propagated by any means, really. And so we have not yet uh, cracked that, that code, so to speak, but we're working on it. One of the things we envision is not that uh, bare orchard floor model in Oregon. We envision a hedgerow system similar to say high bush blueberries or aronia um, where you can harvest over the top and so you can actually have something growing on that orchard floor. Plus it simply isn't an option for us to sweep nuts off the orchard floor because we get rain all fall. It would be a mess, just not viable. Uh, and then along with the uh, the usual outreach education, we're, we're actively involved in, in um, developing processing equipment and helping the industry both on the supply and, and the demand side. The one thing that we really are trying to be cognizant of, and this is being led by our early adopter growers, and you know, both of, of the main uh, people leading the Hazelnut Development Initiative, myself and Lois Braun, are both natural systems agriculture graduate fellows at the Land Institute. So our heart is not 
necessarily creating a, another um, high impact specialty crop. We really envision hazelnuts as a cornerstone species in a new type of agriculture, the kind of agroforestry systems that the Savannah Institute uh, is promoting and developing. And the reason is because our approach to land conservation, for the most part, doesn't work. Uh, what we do is we spend enormous federal dollars on paying farmers not to grow annual row crops, all our land set aside programs, and they don't work because they're susceptible to swings in markets for, for annual uh, commodity crops, and we saw this in 2000. 2008-2009 when prices spiked and all of a sudden all that CRP land came out of production. So what we're after is, is something like the Land Institute envisions or blue, Greenland's Blue Waters where we've got crops that, that serve two purposes. One, they produce viable income for uh, the farmers and two, they do uh, a, a good job on their own of protecting water quality, protecting soil quality, providing wildlife habitat. And this graphic from the Land Institute just says it well. Over those months shown, the plant on the left is annual wheat and the plant on the right is intermediate wheatgrass. And you can see the differences in the rooting profiles. That's what we want on our landscape. We just don't have the crops, the viable crops to, uh, to, to, to pull this off yet, which is what we're, we're, everyone's working on. And this is uh, maybe an overused slide, but it says it well. This is a way to distribute these kind of, or deploy these kinds of woody crop systems on the landscape uh, to achieve these multiple objectives. And, and this is what you know, we're one small part of this overall effort, and that's to develop hazelnuts as a viable alley cropping system or silvopasture even, uh, and deploy it in strategically in windbreaks or riparian buffers. All right, so when we're talking hazelnuts for the upper Midwest, uh, we're, we're talking really about hybrids, but uh, when those hybrids are, you know, essentially uh, three-way crosses or primarily two-way between American hazelnut, European hazelnut, and there's some beaked hazelnut, we think, in the parentage. Um, and these interspecific hybrids provide winter hardiness, EFB resistance, yield, and consistent yield of higher quality kernels than what, say, American hazelnut alone might be able to do. Uh, next slide. So let's talk first about European Oregon-grown uh, cultivars. These are widely available. You can go to most nurseries out west and order these today if you wanted to. And we do have growers in the eastern U.S. trying to do this. Um, most prominently in Canada, in southern Ontario, because of the new Nutella processing facility uh, outside Toronto. So I rely on um, the Simcoe Station in Ontario for their trial data because that's going to give us a sense of just how viable these cultivars are. And for the most part, they're not. Uh, if the plant doesn't die in the winter, then the pollen almost certainly will die in the spring because uh, it's not winter hardiness. And the bigger concern, though, is resistance to eastern filbert blight. Most of these have only single gene resistance, and that gene gas away is already breaking down in some of these varieties to our um, native uh, populations of, of eastern filbert blight. But here's just a slide that shows what they're recommending. Yamhill, Jefferson, and uh, Theta are provisionally recommended for growing in the Canadian hardiness zone 7. Uh, and we, that means up next to the Great Lakes. And if you remember, the southern tip of Ontario is uh, equal to or farther south than 13 U.S. states. So it's not a very representative growing area for the eastern U.S., which is at this point why we're, yeah, you can try these if you want, but from a, a crop standpoint, probably not uh, viable. Next slide. So then we have American hazelnuts, which you can also buy in bulk, uh, seedlings from the DNR or the Arbor Day Foundation or others. And this is just a shot uh, showing what American hazelnut in the woods can do. Uh, in my part of Wisconsin, far up north, we have acres and acres and acres of American hazelnut. Um, and we, we see sometimes some really nice plants. Next slide. This is the, an example of the Mukwa Barrens, and it's nothing but hazelnut as far as the eye can see give you some sense of the scale of American hazelnut. And the reason I show this is that this is a totally undiscovered, underutilized um, treasure of biodiversity. Uh, and no one has ever looked at these populations for crops um, or crop development purposes. And that, that's something that we have started to do. Next slide. So this shows some of the sites in Wisconsin that we have gone through. And we have probably just as many sites in uh, Minnesota that we've surveyed and basically we walk through these sites to identify the top yielding plants that we can. Uh, we dig them up or at least a part of the crown and, and have brought them back to our uh, germplasm trials to evaluate them in a cultivated setting. Next slide. 
We've also saved, saved seed from these plants in our uh, Hayward State Tree Nursery. This is a couple of years old now, so we're growing out thousands of these seedlings uh, to try to, again, find individuals that, that have some crop characteristics, primarily larger nut size. If anyone's harvested wild American hazelnut, the, the kernels almost aren't big enough to make it worth uh, messing with the cracking. Next slide. So when we're talking hazelnuts in the Midwest or, or Eastern U.S., we're talking about hybrid hazelnuts. So let's first look at clonal hazelnuts. And by clonal versus species, I mean, um, you know, most woody crops, we're dealing with clonal materials. So you buy apples, you're buying Honeycrisp or John of Prince or whatever, right? And so everyone's identical. So we've got that part of it. Or you can buy seedling apple trees. And so every tree grows from a seed rather than from a cutting. And every one of those is different. So we've got two approaches that are being investigated in the upper Midwest, growing clonal material of proven genotypes or growing a bunch of seedlings and hoping that the average yield is good enough. Next slide. So on the, uh, this is where we put most of our efforts on the clonal side. This shows you um, some survey information we did back in 2010. Each blue dot shows a hazelnut planting that we have uh, were able to get a survey response back from. You know, and at the time, there was about 130 growers. While I'm on this slide, I do encourage all of you, if you uh, do grow hazelnuts, if you go to our website, midwesthazelnuts.org, there's a, a form, a contact form that you can fill out. It just gives us some information about where your planting is. And this is important because when we're trying to compete for grant funding to support the industry or make the argument that we need positions, um, we need numbers. We need to convince decision makers that hazelnuts are for real and that there's actually a lot of people out there interested in it. And unless we have that information from you, then we're not able to compile it. So I definitely encourage you to, to fill out that short survey on our, on our website. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a graph that shows, back in 2010 anyway, we asked the growers, how many did you plant and how many are still alive today? And you can see back then we had a significant mortality problem. People were, were planting little wimpy seedlings in the summer leafed out under high stress conditions, probably not very good weed control, and they were killing most of their plants. So this was one of our first efforts was just to try to do some basic outreach education on how to grow woody plants. And I hope we've, we've made some success, but it gives you some sense of one, how many plants have been planted at that time and where they're coming from. Next slide. So what we've done is screen all of these on-farm plantings, not all of them, but a, a big chunk of them. And similar to what we did in the Wild American Stands, we went looking for the best plants. And in some cases, the growers themselves had identified their top plant. And then we mound layered them to create copies and have been evaluating them since 2009 in our replicated performance trials. And there's five of them spread across Wisconsin, Minnesota. Next slide. Uh, and basically, we would, you know, take the top one from farm A, top one from farm B, top one from farm C, and uh, distribute them in the trials. It's just a graphic that shows that process. Next slide. And one thing we're interested, if you're doing breeding, you want to make sure you've got genetic diversity uh, to, to choose from. And this is kind of a busy slide, but it shows you um, that those dots, the more spread out they are, I guess, on the graph, the more genetic diversity there is, and there was concern that most of these seedlings were coming from really only two breeders, Badger Set and Forest Ag Enterprises, and we had no idea really were they saving seeds from just one or two plants every year, or were they, did they have a fairly diverse uh, um, pool that they were drawing from, and it looks like, yes, they, they had quite a bit of diversity in plant material that they were sending out to growers, which is a good thing for us from a breeding standpoint, because we have a lot to choose from. It's not so good if you're a grower because it means you've got just as many bad plants as you do good plants, and so your average yields may not be economically viable. Next slide. Uh, we'll see if this works, but this is a flyover of the Bayfield um, germplasm trial, and want you to see two things. Uh, one, these are being grown as shrubs in hedgerows, and just gives you some idea of how many different plants we are evaluating. As we move up the hill here, the soils get uh, much drier, sandier, and the plants are smaller. So this is one of five sites, and uh, you know this is probably the second largest. So, and since 2009, we've been able to collect a considerable amount of data on the performance. And we can go to the the next slide. <clears throat> 
Yeah, sit that arrow over there. There we go. So this is the kind of plant we're looking for. This happens to be Eric 421, but you can see what some of these plants are capable of. Uh, by year four, this is what they do. They're, they're just dripping with uh, nut clusters. So this is the kind of thing that we're looking for. Next slide. And here they are. You can all admire, uh, admire these beauties. These are the top ten selections that we've made uh, after, what, seven, eight, nine years of evaluation. These are the ones that we're actively trying to propagate vegetatively to get out to growers as fast as, as we can. Uh, generally, the nut size is smaller than Europeans, um, and that's just the way it's going to be for this first generation material, but the yields are as high or higher than what you can get in uh, Oregon orchards. Uh, next slide. So we've got, we feel confident that there's demonstrated resistance to EFB. These were all field inoculated at all five locations, and we would expect to see EFB by now. Um, we certainly have demonstrated cold hardiness with these. They survived even the winter of 2013. And we chose them primarily for consistent and high yield densities. And by high yield density, I mean pounds of kernel per acre. Not so much pounds of kernel per plant. We're interested more in per, per acre. We'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, I say adequate kernel quality. The flavor is great. The shape is great of these, but the size is definitely smaller than what's grown in Oregon. Whether or not that's a disadvantage, I don't know, but that's going to depend on you as growers to make sure you can market smaller kernels. Now, if you're making a value-added product and you're squeezing it for oil or you're chopping it up for something else, it doesn't matter how big it is. What matters is, is your yield per acre and whether or not, or your yield per lineal foot if you've got it in some sort of a diversified um, mixture. Next slide. So the first thing we've done, uh, with, we finally were able to get enough uh, clonal material uh, to establish some joint performance trials. We have uh, six in the ground, two in Iowa, two in Wisconsin, two in Minnesota, and it includes at this point uh, eight of the ten of our selections, seven of the selections from, the, from Grimo Nut Nursery out in Ontario, uh, two of the three from the Hazelnut Consortium, which is Oregon State, Nebraska, and Rutgers. And we hope to get four from the Rutgers breeding program. And we may actually have some from private breeders that have been uh, working on this as, uh, on their own as well. And the goal of these tr uh, trials is to get all of the best material uh, from the various breeding programs in common garden planting so growers can see them, but also we can generate comparison data to help you make decisions when you do buy hazelnuts. None of these, well, with the exception of Grimo material in, in limited quantities, none of these are yet uh, available in, in large quantities. Two of the consortium selections are, are getting closer, um, what they call the Beast and um, Grand Traverse, which has been around for a while. Next slide. So in addition to the first selection, we started in 2012 our own crossing program. So we've been crossing our best material with pollen from Oregon to try to generate even better hybrids. Next slide. And uh, Lois uh, Brown in Minnesota has generated a lot of offspring, uh, almost 10,000 plants uh, to choose from over the, the coming years. So hopefully there's a, just like in any woody crop industry, hopefully there's the even better material uh, in the pipeline. Next slide. All right, so seedlings. If you are a hazelnut grower right now, most likely you're growing seedlings, and most likely you got those from Forest Ag or Badger Set. Next slide. So let's talk about their performance. Um, we took one of the full sib families from Forest Ag Enterprises and created um, some larger scale plantings, larger scale one acre, but four to 500 plants per site at three locations, Bayfield, Spooner, and Stoughton, Bayfield's far northern Wisconsin on crappy, sandy soils where it's cold all the time, and Stoughton, Wisconsin, which is south of Madison on the most beautiful soil you've ever seen. Um, and this shows you that uh, the CR9 is one of the parents and GR8 is the other parent in the uh, upper left corner of the, the nut display there. And that shows you the rest of them are individual selections from the Stoughton planting, individual seedlings. And you can see they're still variable, right? Even though this is a full sibling family, we have a lot of variability in plant form, productivity, and uh, kernel size and shape. Next slide. So we established these from tiny little seedlings. We put tubes on them. We controlled the weeds. Next slide. And uh, we used a tube, which may or may not be, uh, they definitely help them grow, but a full tube probably isn't necessary because they get a little floppy like you see here a year and a half later. Uh, next slide. 
And by 2015, this is the Spooner site, uh, middle of the state. Next slide. And by 2017, we've got what I'd call a mature shrub uh, that is definitely you know worth picking. So that's what year seven of the project. Uh, next slide. Now, site matters a lot. Actually, this is age six at Stoughton, the richer fertility site. And you can see these things are almost six feet tall. And by now, this shot was taken in 2016. This, by this fall, the, the roads were pretty much grown in. So that six by 15 space may be actually too close on a high fertility site like Stoughton. Next slide. Whereas in Bayfield, same age, same plant material. You can see how much smaller they are and how much space there is. Now, here's the interesting part. Those plants at Stoughton had yield densities roughly the same as Bayfield. The difference was that Bayfield's plantings, plants are a lot smaller, so the total yields were larger. The way you fix that is you add more plants at establishments, so you fill that hedgerow faster. Now, the plants are smaller at Bayfield, which means they're easier to manage than they are at Stoughton, which, because of the fer fertile sites, they, uh, they grow so vigorously. So if we're trying to mechanically harvest or manage these, we may actually have an advantage growing these on poorer soils, uh, which creates a lot of opportunity, especially up north where we can't grow anything else. Um, but the land's going to be cheaper, um, and we can grow these on less than optimal sites, so we're not necessarily competing with other crops. Next slide. So we're measuring winter hardiness, nut load ratings on all these, in-shell yield, kernel yield, all the usual stuff that, that you would want to measure. Next slide. And here's what we found. Um, so this is showing the percentage of the hybrid plants, so the ones we got from Forest Ag, and C. Americana plants, the ones we got from the DNR. We wanted to compare the two. Are hybrids really from these seedlings much better than just straight C. Americana? So this shows the percentage of the plants that produced at least some nuts at ages 5, 6, and 7. 5 is blue, orange is 6, gray is age 7. And you can see um, at Spooner, in some cases, the you know the hybrids were not necessarily producing um, nuts any earlier than C. americana. In some cases, C. americana was producing uh, nuts faster. Uh, next slide. So this shows uh, nut load ratings of three or higher. So we rate these from zero to five. Zero, they produce no nuts. Five is the most exceptional yields you've ever seen. And at the rating of three, that's when we think that's roughly um, where it's worth picking. So if we're growing these commercially, we would like all of our plants in a planting to be a three or higher by age five, really, uh, at the minimum, and with some nut production before that. So you can see at these sites, neither the Americana or the hybrids, um, on average, uh, or the percentage of the total plants, if we had 100 plants, uh, you know, less than 50% of them hit that yield rating of three, even by age uh, six or age seven. And in some cases, the Americana was, was out yielding the hybrids. Next slide. So this shows the extrapolated uh, per acre yields, and the most important thing to look at would be the uh, vertical axes, the 160 through 0, that is pounds of kernel per acre. None of these plants were capable of producing, uh, on average, across the entire planting, anything close to uh, an economically viable yield. Now, if these plants are mixed in some other diverse system, that's a different story. Then it's just a complement or a part of a larger overall system. But if it's judged just on hazelnut production, these yields just simply aren't, aren't economically viable. So this is if you take the average of all the plant material. Next slide. If you take the average of the top five plants, you take the top performing plants of each of the hybrids in the Americana at each of these three sites, you start seeing yields closer to 330 pounds. And in some cases, on a kernel yield per acre, C. Americana is actually out yielding the, the hybrids. So this would suggest, well, you're probably just better off planting Americana, uh, pure Americana from the DNR. But the difference is, is in kernel size. So the hybrids definitely have a larger kernel size, and that, that might alone uh, clinch the deal. The point being that um, seedlings alone likely don't produce high enough average yields, at least the seedlings we have available to us now. So that's why there's so much interest in looking at individual plants within those populations, cloning them, just like we do in any other woody crop um, that we grow. Next slide. So just a couple shots, next slide, of the kinds of plants, the diversity within those seedling populations. Next slide. 
So recommendations, if you do plant these seedlings, if you, if you choose to, to, to not wait for the hybrid clonal material, but you want to just keep buying seedlings, uh, you've really got to give it every advantage you can to get decent yields. That means good weed control, good fertility, good water management, good deer management. I think you also should be a data grower. Uh, you know, pay attention to the individual plant performance and keep track of those that seem to be doing the best that potentially could be um, vegetatively propagated. And most likely, if you're trying to, to use hazelnuts for profit, you're going to have to have these in, if you're growing the seedlings in diverse mixtures, uh, where it's just a complement to the system. Now, other F1 families or these progeny seedling families might perform better, but the ones that we evaluated, uh, we, we only had one to evaluate. Didn't, wasn't good enough, I don't think. Next slide. On our website is a publication that lays out our best guess scenario on the uh, hedgerow hazelnut production system in terms of how you would do it and then what the numbers look like. What are the economics? So there's a boatload of assumptions built into that document, but you can read through it and all the assumptions are identified. Next slide. Um, the reason we like this hedgerow system is a couple of advantages of over-the-top mechanical harvest that allows us to do vegetated row middles with multiple stems. We've got better weather resistance. We can lose a stem and not lose the whole the whole tree uh, or shrub. Um, we've got better fruiting wood ratios because we've got uh, more surface area to collect sun and it's adapted to regions with lower cost land. So it's a lot of uh, nice advantages to our system. Next slide. So this, let's talk harvest. This is generally what we mean by over-the-top harvest. This is an old BEI blueberry harvester, and the plants go through the tunnel, and there's bars in there that, that rock back and forth that knock the hazelnuts off the shrub, and they're collected and come out in bins in the back. And they can handle, as you see with this one, uh, pretty large shrubs. So this may not be the optimal mechanical harvest system, but it just shows you that it's already being done and uh, with some optimization, it could be done even better. I also think mechanical harvest is really the only option. Uh, the labor costs to hand pick uh, are just too high because you're not picking blueberries, for example, that you put in a crate and sell. You're picking clusters, and so you've got to remove the, 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 um, the involucre. Then you have to remove the shell, and what you're left with is, you know, maybe 20% of what you actually harvested. Uh, so it drives up that labor cost pretty quickly. So let's look at the hedgerow yield potential. Uh, I think of this and evaluate it not on a per plant basis. I don't really care how many pounds of nuts your best plant produced. I want to know how much it produced per uh, square foot of canopy coverage because then we can, we can project that out more readily to a, a square foot uh, basis or a, a, a per acre basis. Next slide. Uh, I won't go into as much detail, but we have, based on the, the yields of our top plants, those first generation selections, put together some yield projections on a per acre basis and a per plant basis. And I think these are realistic numbers to use in your enterprise budgeting. Next slide. Now, the, this shows the USDA grades for kernel size, extra large down to whole and broken. And our top selections, uh, that we selected based on overall yield, not kernel size, fall into the medium, small, and whole and broken size classes. So they're a lot smaller. You know, can we sell them? Next slide. Uh, again, this is stuff you can come back to in the archived presentation or look through our documents online, but it gives you some idea of the annual net income by year for both the hedgerow hazelnut system that we're working with and the Oregon system for comparison. And we think our initial costs are going to be higher because we're establishing at higher plant populations. Oregon might be 200 to 250. We're going to be closer to 900 plants per acre, I think. Uh, but the beauty of a perennial crop is your expenses are minimal after establishment phase, and so your annual net income can be substantial. Uh, this is before pity is a principal interest taxes and um, uh, insurance. Uh, or interest, and so the the returns are going to vary based on your situation in terms of your land ownership costs, your equipment ownership costs, but generally you can see some significant uh, net income potential for this crop. Next slide. But the challenge is going to be these reverse J curves. Can you handle the 
um, uh, losses in the first few years, the investment, if you will, before you break even, which even in the organ system with high prices, you're still looking at six, seven, eight, nine years into the future. It should be noted, though, that this isn't any different for, say, blueberries or other uh, mainline woody perennial crops. The other issue, of course, becomes the opportunity cost of investing those dollars in hazelnuts rather than putting them in some other investment. But again, financial decisions that it's going to be different for, for every, everybody. Next slide. So we've built a spreadsheet tool that you can use to build your own enterprise budgets. This is on our website, and I definitely recommend you go through it. It'll help educate you about the steps involved in hazelnut production, and then you can start to plug in your own numbers and figure out what, uh, whether this is a, a crop that might work for you. Next slide. So these first generation selections, uh, we anticipate they're going to be available starting in fall 2019. They will be limited basis by then. And we have not worked out all the details, but our plan is for groups of growers to get together in clusters. And they will, they will basically submit a proposal to us that says, um, you know, this is what we want to grow. This is uh, the infrastructure that we have to support the production. And this is what we're going to do to educate ourselves about it and evaluate performance. Um, and then those proposals will be selected and growers within those clusters would be licensed to grow this plant material. The reason we're doing this is twofold. One, we want, we want grower collaborators because this is still in some ways experimental material and we want to make sure we're working with you to evaluate the performance across as many environments as we can. The other part is simply from a supply side or a supply chain development. Because of the costs involved in mechanical harvest and processing, it's far more efficient if the production is clustered, and we're using a 50-mile radius for a cluster size, uh, so that people can share costs on, on harvesting the equipment. Instead of what we have now, our individual growers scattered throughout the upper Midwest, and it's almost impossible just from sheer transportation costs to pool that production or, or share in any of the expenses for growing. But stay tuned, this information will be made available to um, via our website when it comes out and we'll also be working with organizations like the Savannah Institute to get this information out to growers. Next slide. So I'm going to move quickly here, we don't have a whole lot of time left, uh, I'll walk you through what's happening with the harvest and processing. We created a hazelnut processing accelerator uh, with multiple partners and our goal is to do the research and investigation and, and sleuthing to find the equipment that's best suited for our hazelnuts and actually uh, set it up into an incubator facility, which right now is uh, operating in Ashland, but it may move back to West Madison in the future. Um, and the goal is to, to be the bridge until there's enough production out there to justify private investment in a full-blown processing facility. And when that time comes, hopefully they can turn to us and say, hey, what's the best equipment? And we'll say, this is what you need. So the other thing we're doing, that we, we're the brand new owners of that uh, olive harvesting machine, which we think is well suited for hazelnut harvest. And um, we are going to be testing that and tweaking that and optimizing it. So the same kind of thing. Once it's really needed, we'll have it all figured out and the growers can just um, figure out how to buy it, basically, and use it. Next slide. So let's walk through the processing steps. Most of the hazelnuts are harvested like this. Now, they're not quite this green, but they're in an involucre or in the husk. Next slide. And for the most part now they're being dried. This is the same thing that happens in Turkey. All these are dried in you know any number of ways. Smaller growers will do it in onion bags. Some will do it in, in pallet bins. In Turkey they have huge piles just on the side of the road, on top of buildings, wherever they can can get it to, to dry them out. Next slide. So you've got something like this. Now you've got to extract the in shell nuts from that husk. Next slide. And we can start small with a, a bucket husker. Uh, next slide. There's a barrel husker, which is about the stage most growers are at right now. And it's basically a hammer mill. You dump that stuff in there. There's beaters within that drum. And it just bangs it around until the husk falls off. Next slide. Here's the super squirrel that was developed. This runs the material through two belts to strip off the dried husk. Next slide. This is the X2000 husker that was built and has since been modified. Uh, next slide. And next slide, we're going to skip this one. Um, so the goal, though, is that we want to get rid of that drying step. It takes too much energy. It takes too much time to get that material dried. So we've been working with this machine, which is 
has been shown to be able to remove the husks uh, when they're still green. So they come right out of the field, go through the husker, and now you've got in-shell nuts instead of having to dry them. And our goal ultimately is to incorporate this kind of technology into the harvesting equipment itself so that the husking is done in the field and you don't even have to, to deal with it um, back at the, the shop. Next slide. Now you've got in-shell nuts, all different shapes and sizes, primarily because they're from seedlings. If you're growing clonal material, you're going to have a little bit more uniformity in the size and shape, which makes it a whole lot easier to, to process it. Next slide. First step, run it through a size sorter. This is a, a drum sizer. And next slide, and we can create 12 different size classes. So from a uh, minimum diameter for these in-shell nuts, this is roughly the distribution. You can see most of the nuts that come off these seedling plantings are in that 12 to 13 millimeter, uh, minimum millimeter uh, diameter, and some up to 16 millimeters and some you know, as small as eight or nine. Generally what we've found is we can, with the technology we have now that's not very expensive, we can crack everything 12 millimeters and up. When we get to a, 11s and 10s, it's just too difficult and too expensive to try to extract those tiny little kernels from the shell fragments. It can be done, but it just needs better equipment and, and likely a, a color sorter, laser color sorter. Next slide. So then you've got the in-shell nuts, now you crack them, small scale, there's the Dave built on the left and the, the drill cracker on the right, which is what our, most people use. Uh, there's a lot more information about this on our website and our processing symposium. Next slide. Uh, this is an organ impact cracker, so there's a million ways to do this cracking, but there's a bigger scale. Next slide. Uh, this is some older equipment that is uh, roller sizers on the top, so it sizes the nuts as it goes through and they drop down into some roller crackers. Uh, next slide. This is some equipment out in Oregon that's, uh, I believe it's Italian made, that kind of twists the nut to, to, to crack the, sh the kernel. But any different way to, a million different ways to crack and what you end up with is, next slide, a mix of whole kernel and shell fragments and now the fun begins. Now the expensive part begins is separating those kernels from the shell fragments. Next slide. We can use air. This is an aspirator, so the heavy stuff drops out into the five-gallon bucket and the lighter, smaller shell fragments get pulled up through the vacuum. Next slide. It works okay. You can run it through a roller sizer. Similar concept. Next slide. Uh, or as you get more sophisticated and as volumes get bigger, this is the kind of thing that we're looking at. At some point, our industry will have to do this size and scale. So this is combining roller sizing, um, with a um, uh, inclined um, slot sizer with an air column uh, for air separation and then we don't see it in this picture but then through a laser color sorter. Next slide. No matter how big or small your processing line, even the huge ones out in Oregon, all end with this. A hand inspection table where you've got a crew standing around a conveyor belt picking out the last little bits and pieces that the um, mechanical side wasn't able to do. And this is where most of your labor cost is. Next slide. Okay, so we've, we've got to think about on the marketing side, we don't have anywhere near enough to, to talk to people like Hershey's, right? And we don't necessarily want to either because they're not going to pay top price. So as we're still small as an industry, we're talking about local and direct sale, farmers markets, co-op grocery stores, friends and family. Uh, as we get a little bit bigger, we can and then even at a small scale, you can do this, adding value, uh, making, uh, squeezing it for oil, gluten-free flour, making spreads, confections, that kind of thing. The question is, can this be done profitably because you've got um, such a high cost kernel uh, and as that moves up the value chain, you, you really get priced out of the market. Uh, eventually, we'll get to a size where we're supplying mid-scale food manufacturers like they do in the current, currently in Oregon. Uh, eventually as we get even bigger and this becomes more of a commodity, then you can feed nationally branded products. You can supply um, things like Hershey's Kisses and that kind of thing. Ultimately what we would like to see is that this gets big enough scale that we consider it an oilseed crop and we can replace hopefully significant acres of annual row crops. Next slide. So the American Hazelnut Company is a 17-member um, hazelnut processing and marketing company in Gaze Mills, Wisconsin, and here's some of the products that they're producing, oil, flour, and full um, kernels. Next slide. I won't say a lot about this, but you can join the company if you want and participate in building the industry and producing those products. Next slide. So last slide, uh, what's next? 
we are getting ready for the what we think will be end of January, early February. We'll we'll send out the request for proposals, and grower clusters will make a pitch about why they should have the hazelnuts uh, and how they're going to grow them. And we'll continue to see investment in the uh, harvesting and processing capacities. So we're ready for you when you do have significant and you've got production. And generally, I think this is at this point, it's certainly a high risk crop. What it but with the tailwinds that we have and the support that's out there right now, it's definitely a high reward crop. So it's something to um, to pay attention to for sure. And really, I think we're at a point that we can start scaling up. I think we've got enough uh, demonstrated quality germplasm that once it's available in quantity, we can we can go. So thanks for your time. Uh, I moved quickly. Again, you can review this, um, listen again, or, or flip through the slides at the Savannah Institute uh, website. Thank you, Kelly. Wonderful, amazing, Jason. So much information there. Um, do you have time for a couple questions? Or yeah, you bet. Or, okay, so here we go. Mary Ellen, you should be live. Still working on it. Hi. Yep, we can hear you, Mary Ellen. Oh, thank you. I didn't know. I didn't know my microphone was on. <laughs> I wondered if Jason had done any research about complementary alley cropping yeah we haven't uh, looked at it I think there's sort of two zones of complementary alley cropping there's the zone between the rows where the hazelnut roots or the I should say the hazelnut crown really isn't there right so then you could grow pretty much whatever you want as long as you've got enough Sun depending on the plant size in terms of growing crops within the row itself uh, we haven't looked looked at it but there's been work by at uh, Illinois um, University of Illinois and I think even the Savannah Institute of can you intermix with trees uh, or other fruit crops say for example uh, chestnuts um, it's going to make mechanical harvest perhaps a bit trickier but at a permaculture scale or hand harvesting scale I think it's po it's possible generally what we don't like growing within the rows are rhizomatous species quack grass brome um, because they're just so competitive with with the hazelnuts, so we'd like bunch bunching crops, you know, like bunch grasses or or um, certainly legumes are going to have a role because of the nitrogen fixation. My colleague at Minnesota is doing a lot of work with um, nitrogen trials, and especially if we're we're export or you know harvesting protein rich hazelnuts, that means we're exporting a lot of nitrogen, and so adding that nitrogen f through cover crops or um, legumes planted within the rows. Uh, is a good idea. Now the birds love to deposit all kinds of seeds and so as your your rows mature you're going to start seeing stuff you had no idea, you know, mulberry and buckthorn and all that stuff moves in. All right, thank you Mary Ellen. Have folks been looking at silver pasture options at having animals within the rows? Yeah, and it's the, you know, the it's like any silvopasture system, you just have to manage the, the grazing and the browsing. So hazelnuts are really not preferred browse because they have these sticky trichomes. Even the deer, they, they'll browse it, but they typically don't chew it to the ground like they would something, high bush cranberry or something. So I've, you know, I've seen people graze horses, I've seen them graze cows, sheep, and as long as there's some grass for them to eat, they'll, they'll leave the hazelnuts. But as soon as that's all there's left to eat, then they start to browse it pretty heavily. There has been some talk of using a smaller statured um, livestock, um, like a smaller sheep, to chew down the suckers once the plants are mature. And then, you know, running pigs through in the fall for sure is an option to pick up any drops. Um, they're not in there too long. They, they won't cause much damage. And then, of course, Main Street's project with uh, chickens. And the chickens do, mainly they smother things just by traffic and trampling. Um, there's going to be some questions, I think, especially with the feds, once these systems get to scale, is the um, risk of contamination with the manure that's in those systems. Something that silvopasturists are, are all having to think about, especially when you're mixing with food crops. Speaking of expansion, I'm wondering uh, if folks are thinking about where the potential land, if, if the sort of pro projections for expansion in the Midwest happen like they have in Oregon uh, where might that land be <laughs> yeah well it's encouraging to see that we can get good high 
yield densities off this material on you know northern parts of of Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, you know, zone three, zone four, not a lot of heat units on sand. Uh, American hazelnut is adapted to the crappiest soil in Wisconsin. That's really all you find it anymore. And it does fine, um, which is exciting because that opens up a, a pretty big land base. Uh, I think because the, the really the main consideration is the harvesting. It's going to have to be mechanically harvested. Um, and that means you can't really be on really steep slopes. Um, you know, the harvesting units are hydraulically controlled. You can raise and lower either side to accommodate some slope, but um, it's going to make it a, a little bit more difficult. But really, it doesn't have real strong preferences on pH, and we see it growing on, uh, you know, sand or, or clay. Uh, Oregon hazelnuts, it's a pretty heavy clay soil out there. So it's pretty widely adapted. Any final words, Jason? Yeah, I guess if you're looking to, um, you know, stay connected, use our website, midwesthazelnuts.org. Uh, our annual conference will be in Wisconsin this year, the second weekend of March. We haven't set the exact location yet. Um, that's usually the best way, and then we try to do an annual field day. I do encourage you, uh, if you have any interest to, to share expenses and be involved in a, in a group business is to contact the folks at the American Hazelnut Company, uh, AmericanHazelnutCompany.com, um, to get involved in the processing side. Because once you jump into this, you're going to realize just how capital intensive and time intensive it is. And being able to share those costs is really valuable. You don't have to do it with American Hazelnut Company. You know, just getting together as a group of growers um, is, at this point, I think, really the only viable way to do it. Okay, well on that, thank you so much Jason for the expertise and all the information um, and everyone for joining us. Within about a week, I'll send a follow-up email to all the folks registered um, with this recording as well as the PDF of all the slides so you can take your time going through all those resources. Um, and also just let us know if you have any feedback about our Nutshell series and definitely keep an eye out for the rest of the fall. Uh, they happen every other week, so definitely join us for those. Um, and with that, I hope everyone has a great evening. Thanks again, Jason. You bet.